Yukon Striker is the world's tallest, longest, and fastest dive coaster. And I just built the entire thing out of Connects, so let me tell you exactly how I did it. The first thing that I always work on during a build is a 3D printed custom train. So I've just realized they are flawless design. They don't actually have a floor. The floor is raisable in the station instead, which means that these bases, which attach to my train system bases, they only need to hold the seats and they don't actually need to have a floor underneath them. So that should mean that we can extend the middle part out so that we can reach all of the screw holes for mounting it to the train system. And once I had a base to mount everything to, I got to work on test printing the restraint. Yukon Striker actually has these vest restraints bars on them, just like the swarm at Thor Park. Because the detail on these bars were quite small, I actually had to use the smallest 0.2 millimeter nozzle that I had for my printer. But the test print came out perfectly and now it was time to commit to the full multicolor print. Now I did this about a month ago, so I didn't yet have a multicolor system for my printer. So what I had to do was actually program the printer to pause itself once it had finished printing the vest part, and then I manually changed the filament over to silver for the bars. And after removing the supports, I could tell they came out absolutely flawlessly. The seats were an easy single color print, and after gluing them all together, we had three rows of fully finished seats. <laughs> Another perfect 3D model. They just clip into place, they're not glued. I made sure the bottoms were aligned and it's perfect. These seats are looking absolutely amazing. I just need to do now the bases that they sit and glue on top of and then obviously do those in red and then make sure they've got the screw holes so that they can fit on top of the train system. So I've got the little seat holders here which just clip onto the bottom of the seats and then glue onto the top of those pieces there. So it's only these and the actual true bases that attach to the train system that's left to print now. So after printing off the seat holders and then printing off the silver bases which attach to the train system, I glued everything together and the train was finally finished. And now with a fully functional replica train, we can move on to building the track. Just like I do in all of my builds, I start with the end of the ride first, so the brake run and the station, and then I work backwards throughout the layout. The reason why I do this is so that I can make sure that each element creates enough speed for the train to get into the one after it. This also means that I won't run into any situations where I build the lift hill first, build the whole layout, and then realize I don't have enough speed left for it to get back into the brake run. This final helix section was actually pretty easy. I just used a bunch of black cross ties with black flexi rods and some black tubing threaded through the middle of the cross ties to give some extra strength and rigidity. Once about half of the turn was complete and I could start building the structure for the little airtime hill that goes over the entrance into the brake run, I could then perform a clearance test to see if the airtime hill had enough space under it for the train to roll under. So I've just set it up with two rows for now, not putting the second car on just yet. I wanted to see if this works clearance wise. This is where you have that little bunny hill after the mid course break. All right, it clears. Actually quite a lot of space as well. The train is not as big as I thought it would be. And after finishing off the track for the airtime hill and the turn, it was time to finally give it its first test run. Now sometimes I will actually keep parts of old projects, like the, the project I built just before this was Mako, and I actually kept Mako's mid-course brake run. And Mako's mid-course brake run actually turns out to be the perfect height to be Yukon Striker's mid-course. Which means that building Yukon Striker's mid-course and connecting it to the stuff we already previously built was super easy. So I finished the final helix and the mid-course brake run, which is actually this final section of the ride just here but it's now time to start working on the end of the mid course that leads into this little Immelman section and of course build the vertical loop as well. Now building this Immelman was a little bit more difficult than I thought it would be and I think it has something to do with the fact that it goes up and then into the mid course but not all the way down to the floor first it kind of stays in the air. It's definitely one of the weirdest shaped elements that I've had to build but I managed it in the end and then gave it a test run. 
Now I did finish up this half of the build by placing a break run bar on the mid course, but I ended up forgetting to make the mid course at a steep enough angle so that the car would actually carry on rolling, and it ended up just stopping the car fully in the middle. So I ended up just getting rid of the break run bars when I filmed the final video. With the first half of the build finished, it was time to get working on the most exciting half, the vertical loop, the zero G roll, and the huge Immelman. I actually started on building this weird little straight piece of track that leads from the loop into the smaller Immelman. With the straight track finished, it was time to start working on the vertical loop. I built the first half of the loop, making sure that the shape was correct, and then I simply mirrored the design and copied it over to the other side, after which I figured it would be a good opportunity to give it a little test run. So now that the loop and the Immelman and the mid-course brake run are completely finished, it's time to separate these here and store away the Immelman in the other room. I also need to connect the loop structure to the mid-course brake run structure, just so that the angle of everything doesn't change whilst I'm moving it. And then once all that is done, I then need to start working on the pullout that goes into the weird like zero G flip thing, which that will then lead into the main large Immelman from the drop. So first of all, Let's get this moved. Now this next part of the build took me way too long to finish. The zero G roll on Yukon Striker is huge and it's super, super floaty. I originally thought it would be easier to build it backwards. However, just for the zero G, it was actually easier to build the valley in between the main Ilmerman and the zero G and then work forwards and then connect the track up to what was left from the loop. This single element was definitely the one that took the longest for me to build. I don't know why it just ended up being so complicated. It's probably because it stretches over such a large distance, but in the end, we got it done and I think the shaping turned out quite well. In fact, this might be one of the elements that I'm the most happy with out of any build I've ever done. And after finishing off all of the extra little bits of support and fully connecting it to the structure, it was time to move on to the final big element. So that is the zero G roll finished. And now I need to build the Immelman. So what I'm gonna do is separate this roughly here, put that section away in the other room, move all of this towards the door, and hopefully that gives me enough space to build the Immelman just against this wall. The idea is that I want to be able to test the first drop, the Immelman, and the zero G roll all in one to make sure it works. The next step was to move everything out of the room, so I just had the entrance into the zero G roll. Then I started working on the bottom of the first drop that led into the big Immelman. So I've glued this little height marker on here and that represents is the height of that zero G roll. So what this basically means is I need to build the Immelman about this tall in order to have enough speed going into the zero G roll. This bit was going to be the bottom of the first drop but I think it looks about right to do the right size Immelman as well. So I think what I'm going to do is just copy this and reverse it on that side. I then replaced all of the track that I had just put in, but this time with these really, really strong black carbon rods. These things are much more rigid. And then I finished off the Immelman. It actually did not take very long. I'd say building the Zero G roll was probably three times longer. For some reason, the Immelman was a lot simpler. And I have to say, the shaping looks almost perfect. Oh, this thing is huge. I did actually do it a tiny bit taller than I wanted to, but I guess technically it is up at the at the level. I just originally built the structure to that level, and then I thought, mm, just in case speed-wise, because it needs to carry extra speed through there, and then extra speed through the loop, I just thought, like, why not make it a little bit bigger? I don't need to get that much speed into it, because it's a drop straight into it. It's a smaller build, but it's got some big elements, so you know what? I'm actually going to be really happy with this, as long as it fits together when I take it outside. And after completely finishing the Immelman and adding in all of the extra supports and track for the bottom of the drop, it was time to get started on the final section of the ride, the main drop and the lift hill. Okay, so I've moved everything over. We have the brake run here, which goes underneath the top of the drop. I just need to build the turn 
the top of the lift, the lift itself, and the final little turn, and then just like extend the length of the brake run and station so that it fits. I've also transferred the design over to the brand new train system. So now each wheel assembly moves side to side. So the performance is actually a little bit quicker now. I thought I'd let everybody know that the brand new train systems have now just launched on the new website. We have Still Vengeance, both of the different Air Force One colorways, just sneaking underneath here because I'm running out of desk space. We have some Hyperia train designs. And I think my favorite one yet, we have a Zardra train design. This is probably the most highest quality one that I have. And for those more budget friendly people, we actually have a old returning design, but in a slightly higher quality. So it's printed with thinner layers. You can pick the color that you want of it this time. They don't just ship red. So in a way, even though it's cheaper, it's slightly multicolor. It's got black wheels and you can pick whatever color you want for the rest of it. So let's get on and finish Yukon Striker. So now all we had left to do was finish the lift, finish the turn at the top of the lift, and then connect the bottom of the lift all the way around through the station and to the brake run. This did not take me very long and before I knew it, I had finished Yukon Striker.